your podcasters were so preoccupied whether they could or not make a movie podcast that they never stopped to think of the should. Jurassic Park coming up next. Haven't seen it with Tim Sestito and Tommy Tevenay. Hello, everybody. Welcome on in. Thank you all so much for listening today. This is a podcast where one of us is watching a movie for the very first time, and that is neither Tommy or I. Uh, We have seen Jurassic Park uh, a number of times. Countless times, yeah. Countless times is indeed the correct phrase. Uh, We would have thought our friend here joining the podcast, the man behind the infamous Haven't Seen It theme song, Mr. Ryan Davey would have at least seen Jurassic Park once in his life, but no, never. Only read the book. (laughs) Yeah, everyone was surprised, man. I read the book in high school English (laughs) class. I saw Jurassic World, loved it, but never properly got around to watching the OG. Uh, Honestly, I was probably too scared or too busy watching Star Wars when I was that age um, to watch it. But uh, Were you never a big dinosaur kid? (laughs) No, I was definitely more of a sci-fi. Or this is a sci-fi movie, though. I don't know. I was yeah. I was a huge Star Wars fan. Wasn't a huge Dino guy, though. I don't know. Um, were you guys? Uh, somewhat. I mean, uh, I think it like, was a rub off of my brother being a huge dinosaur guy. I remember he had a poster of Jurassic World, uh, Jurassic Park Two. We shared a room when I was a little kid. So when I was three years old. There was just like a uh, huge poster of a T Rex coming out of a fucking like. Of, of like the forest or something like that, like to attack somewhere of the jungle, and that poster scared the fuck out of me when I was three years old. <laughs> yeah, I but I still saw Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I feel like you got started on the horror and just like thrown into the deep end with stuff that scared you from the beginning, and that's why you're uh, such a horror buff now. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the perk of being the youngest that you get exposed to shit that you probably shouldn't be watching when you're like three years old or four years yeah. old. <laughs> My brother's the same way. Oh my god! Like literally, was obsessed with like Jason and Freddy and all that shit before, <laughs> before I could even watch it. Man, like I still have a tough time with that stuff. <laughs> I, I feel like this needs to be explored more. Like, is younger brother the the pinnacle of being like a giant horror nerd? Like, yeah, exactly. come down to just you being the younger brother and your parents just having a little bit more laxed rules on what comes into the house. I I mean, I had very lax media rules in general. I started watching South Park when I was three years old. So, I mean, that explains a lot, too, there. So, explains <laughs> yeah, your potty sure. mouth, Tommy. Yeah, exactly. Fuck Dude, you. Dude, I'm, I'm trying to be a Jamie from Joe Rogan right now, trying to see if there is a correlation to that on Google. I can't find anything yet, but like <laughs> in my head. Dude, yeah, that, that's that's the head be. cannon. That's the head cannon right there. There's can, gotta Jamie, be. Go ahead, go ahead, Google that. Yeah, can you Google that, Davey? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I just uh, googled younger siblings liking horror. I don't know. It's <laughs> <laughs> it's mostly just posts like my child likes horror movies. What should I do with him? Like, I don't know. Tommy turned out. Fun. <laughs> yeah, it was it was. Oh, <laughs> Teresa Tevene. No. <laughs> yeah, 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 Mrs. Tevene. <laughs> Well, thank you for joining us, Ryan. We appreciate you coming on and allowing us to discuss a movie that I we would have probably have long covered already. I appreciate um, you guys having me, man. Like I, I listen to so many episodes of your podcast. I think probably all the movies that I've seen, except for like ones I've seen in the last like months, I've I've probably listened to the podcast. So I'm excited to be on and hell yeah, appreciate it, guys. So yeah. As you would know, then as a long-time listener, first-time caller, that yeah. that we like to kick off the podcast kind of discussing what movie, show, something you, you've watched recently that you wanted to, to maybe bring up. Absolutely. Man, I've been going, uh, I've been on a little like 80s and 90s comedy nostalgia kick, man. Like, I watched some John Hughes movies. I think I want to talk about Legally Blonde, though, man. Like, another first-time watch for me, um, Mm -hmm. although I knew it was a classic, I kind of uh, got the desire to watch it just because of how uh, prominent Jennifer Coolidge has been in memes lately. And I realized (laughs) I didn't know who the hell she was, man. Like... Um, Stifler's mom. (laughs) That's Stifler's mom, That's true. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. But I think I watched that, like... I watched American Pie when I was like, I don't know, like 13 or something. I didn't know what an actress <laughs> or actor was back then. I thought that was just her mom. You just saw you know? boobs. <laughs> that's that's exactly right, dude. Exactly. Yeah. 
no, but honestly, Legally Blonde, great. Like, I don't know, such a fun one, you know? Like, you don't have to... You don't have to think too hard about it, but also at the same time, I do think it that was another cool moment for like females in comedy, you know, like, yeah, just like how something like uh, like Bridesmaids was in like the early 2010s and stuff like this was like a big one for the 90s, I think, you know, like even uh, I, I would say it's ahead of its time for that reason alone, but probably other stuff as well. Yeah, we covered that on the podcast. I, I don't think I've revisited it since but i yeah. remember loving it i remember the dad with the martini and he's in like literally <laughs> two scenes and I, he was like my favorite character just because he just <laughs> he was great like, yeah it, it would have been whatever if it was just the one scene of him with a martini but he was like at the graduation like plotting with, with a martini. the martini like it's like... like it's attached to his hand almost yeah <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was like a great like early breezy watch and like for a movie i think it was like early 2000s or ever but it was just brought a like, great humor and stuff like that that's pretty much aged well for the most part i'd say and some of those movies like american pie you said hasn't aged well in some parts <laughs> but yeah, Legally Bond, <laughs> still you can watch that tonight and you won't get like i don't know tiktok cancelers that or something <laughs> yeah has tiktok tried to cancel american pie i'm sure if they, they have, must if, have i don't know yeah. if they've discovered well, there's, a, there's that whole scene of shannon elizabeth getting filmed or ever so or yeah. Oh, I'm not <laughs> saying they shouldn't cancel it. They probably should. But uh, yeah, I just I was unaware if they'd. Actually that was a Vice like... article I read. It was like Gen Zers uh, react to '90s movies or something. Oh shoot. Okay. <laughs> Most of them was like shit on American Pie. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> well, yeah. I. This is why for we good don't... reason. This is why we don't <laughs> click Vice articles, Tommy. Okay, we've had this conversation before. We yeah, don't exactly. click random <laughs> Vice articles that start with the headline Gen Z. Um. So Tommy, <laughs> what what movies have you watched uh, this past week? Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about one I saw um, a couple weeks ago, but we didn't get the chance to talk about it. Um, I went to the theaters two weeks ago to go see a screen of Coraline, um, the Henry Selleck uh, stop motion animated movie. The first time I ever saw on the big screen, and God, I forgot how creepy that movie is. As someone that likes horror movies a lot, watching this movie, I was like. I'm actually kind of fucking terrified right now. Um, the friend that we saw it with, uh, Dallin, he hates horror movies. And I remember he told, yeah, he took me at one point during the movie to be like, I hate you for bringing me to this. This is too scary. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it was such a great little watch, a like, great little creepy, like Henry Suck, Tim Burton energy right there. And really fun to see if a big crowd, um, I think you know, people came out in droves flat. So it was really good to see on the big screen again. Well, I've noticed now that it's been the big trend now, like, I, I know for you and I, the inspiration of doing this was that they were re-releasing Jurassic Park in, in theaters uh, and knowing somebody that hasn't hadn't seen it before. Um, Helps. <laughs> but it, it, it seems like Hollywood's kind of realized, like, maybe we don't need to invest $500 million to remake this. We can just put it in theaters and make, like, $2 million. Yeah, I, I definitely think, I mean, like, Jurassic Park over the weekend, I think, made about that, like, one million or two million or something like that. But there's so many movies now that are just, like, untouchable. I mean, you can still play Jaws. I mean, we've seen Jaws countless times in theaters Demi night. Um, and that still hits. That still plays perfectly. You know, you don't need a remake of the shit like that. I feel like, I mean, remakes these days, I feel like it mostly should be just cheap movies that you give shit about in, like, the 80s. I, like, forgot, like, forgotten B movie. Be like, hey, let's just do that concept again. But, Jurassic Park. I mean, like, as long as Spielberg's alive, he's never got this movie remade. <laughs> well, they did. They did remake it. It's called yeah. Jurassic World. What are you talking? That's about? That's a sequel. That's a sequel. That's different. That's, I guess uh, that's a that's a soft reboot is what that's called, Tommy. That is where you do it kind of differently, and it's something I want to talk about when we dive deeper into Jurassic Park. But um, like the sequels in general, because I think they're all different degrees of bad and um yeah we'll i'll leave that at that uh i saw i rewatched wings world I, it nice was, it was on i saw it and nice. i <laughs> put it on like that movie like underrated I, I feel like everybody saw it in like middle school high school liked it then put it in their like f set it and forget it folder like yeah i saw wings world movie's really funny like mike myers had a really good run there of just like very unique poignant humor um and i i appreciate that about him i've heard he's also not the kindest man in the world when you're working with him on set but yeah wayne's world like i definitely recommend re-watching it because it still holds up it's still very funny 
Um, I've actually and- I've I've pitched a rewatch of that with like twice within the last month and stuff to Jazz. I got overruled, but I think I would see it from like a different perspective now that like yeah. I don't know, like we're we're both like we're all all like 30 and stuff and like yeah. super into like music and movies and like they're kind of in that space too and like Wayne's World one towards the end and definitely a lot in Wayne's World too. They're kind of just like, "Oh my god, like should I really be like so obsessed with all this all this stuff like in my life?" And I think that angle would like hit me in a different way and I'd probably like find a new angle to laugh at it too, you know? Every time I watch this movie, I mean, it, it, you always laugh, especially like the whole uh, pizza scene or like the corporate sponsorship. I mean, I just watch a, a clip, pull up that clip on YouTube all the time. <laughs> uh, that scene's great, though. The one that got me was uh, Ed O'Neill is like in it briefly. Um, he's like works at the uh, at the deli, the the hockey deli, and he just has. A, he's the only other one that speaks to directly to the camera, and he's just like, yeah, you know. Why is there nothing wrong when you kill a man in war? It's considered heroism. But when you kill a man from the fists of passion, it's called murder. And then they just go and they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You, you're not allowed to talk to the camera. I was like, that is hilarious. <laughs> it's just so random and amazing. Just very random that Ed O'Neill is like this low-key like psychopath uh, in, this, in that movie. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's time to talk about the movie that came out right before I was born. This is Jurassic Park. On June 11th, dinosaurs and man, two species suddenly thrown back into the mix together. Can I touch it? Sure. How can we possibly have the slightest idea what to expect? Universal Pictures presents a Steven Spielberg film, an adventure 65 million years in the making. Look out! Jurassic Park, rated PG-13. Special premiere tomorrow night. Starts Friday everywhere. So I'm going to call this for me the 10th viewing. I, I don't know. How, however many viewings of Jurassic Park there have been in my life, but it's 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 a high number. Um, yeah. I, I know for Tommy and I, we both saw it in 3D in theaters, but I think most intriguing is is for you, Ryan. You've never seen it before, and, and we were talking before we rolled, but you didn't really touch on your feelings at Jurassic Park, so I'd love to get your overall thoughts from your first viewing, just kind of like your general takeaways. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, honestly, like I, I did love it. I, I went in, I would say, with slightly lower expectations than you may have uh or i don't know then then i should have and um a lot of the parts that i liked about the newer jurassic park like jurassic world was like the actual cgi it looked so futuristic all that stuff and i went in thinking that it was just going to kind of take me out of the world to see like a less advanced rendering of these uh creatures and stuff but i think they did it super well and even the times when the effects like didn't really like live up i guess it kind of reminded me of like Goosebumps style shit, which is my favorite. It just takes me back to that like 90s world of it. But as a movie, like that concept is still so, so wild to me. And I do think we're going to do it soon. We're going to bring back some damn dinosaurs. And <laughs> yeah, it's apparently scientifically possible to plot this movie. <laughs> Dude, I read a popular mechanics article that they uh, there has been around 60 million invested uh, in order to bring back woolly mammoths to somehow combat climate change or something. But they're they're de-extincting a woolly mammoth by 2027 is what this company says they can do. Do or do they like come with like a a blizzard with them like like wherever they go like they're gonna be reintroduced they... into Siberia like I mean, it, 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 it probably would like just fucking help like world hunger because like those things are so kind of massive I, I, will, it, it, I don't know it yeah. said something about like its migration patterns somehow affected it I didn't really get super into the details with I, it but I, yeah that's wild well um. Maybe these people should have watched Jurassic Park because one of the messages of this movie is like you're taking a creature from a prehistoric time and introducing it into a climate and atmosphere 65 million years later. Yep. Like it's not going to know what it is. It's going to be a very defensive creature. Um, they didn't stop to think if they should. You just thought if you could. 
Um, yeah, exactly. Right there. Uh, I, w- I want to touch upon like what you said earlier. I mean, like the uh, the special effects for this movie still play really well. I feel like. Um, yeah. There's definitely a version of this movie that like it could have easily just been like hokey or whatever. Um, Spielberg's initial thought of this movie was going to be doing claymation. Um, and like there's a, a video you can watch on YouTube, which is like a, they did a test of um, the raptors scene where the raptors are in the kitchen, like get, get chase out the kids. And instead of CGI, they did it with like claymation. And it looked a little bit cool, but it definitely just looked a little dated right there. And like, if you saw that now, if you watch that now, like your 2023 lens, like first time watching, like, Oh, this is some like stupid old movie was the way they didn't set up CGI animatronics mix just works perfectly. And like, I really can't see the scenes in this movie in terms of special effects person. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. Like that was the one scene. And I even wrote this down. Like that's the one scene, the Raptors in the kitchen that like the CGI kind of, I don't know. wasn't really holding up for me. You know, every other scene fucking mm-hmm. rocked it. But that one was, I don't know. It was a little, they relied on it a little too much, I think, maybe. Well, that's because they did such, it's the perfect line of blurring your effects and then you won't know. And I think the T, the famous T-Rex sequence, once it's finally revealed, is like the perfect encapsulation of blurring your effects because it's, they're mostly looking at the puppet. Yeah, when it's in a full body shot, it's gonna be the, it's gonna be the CG, and when it's a close up of its head, which is mostly that scene, is a lot of close ups of, of that of its head, that's practical, that's real. So then, in those quick little moments, your eyes not really able to pick up what isn't, what is there, and what isn't there, and it just blurs that line together. And I just think, I mean, just to go on to that scene, now that I mentioned it, the way that the uh, T-Rex is introduced with the wires snapping and then like the cold camera pan up from behind the car up as it's you just see its head as it eats the the goat and then like takes its steps up and it like the body just slowly and slowly reveals like it's just it, it, it's masterful it is and to your point on the claymation like I don't think this movie has the cultural impact it still has today nor do I think it maybe necessarily is the big box office hit it was at the time without the 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 cg without if they mm-hmm. did it with claymation like i think people would be like this is kind of dated this is looks old it works but it's it's kind of old yeah yeah it's like i was a little hokey or ever but um i mean this is my first time really seeing this on the big screen um in terms of like a, a legit movie theater Timmy and i have seen it on um during a drive-in movie theater uh, don't feature jaws but um, seeing this in like surround sound, like uh, movie theater sound, like the T Rex scene is special. Just the sound design right there of just like hearing the fucking like water like, shake and just um, hearing like the fucking footsteps just like over and over and over again. And then that fucking like roar or growl is just so fucking powerful. And like, you know, I've seen this movie like fucking countless times, probably 20, 30 times, maybe more. Um, still fucking hit me in that new dimension of just hearing that fucking roar. <laughs> Dude, yeah, I think I think probably my favorite part of the whole movie was how much tension they built with the whole like the water shaking. Like anytime the T-Rex would would approach, you'd see something shaking. Like at first yeah. it was the cup of water, then it was the puddle, then the the girl holding the jello, the jello just starts shaking and then everyone just like and you know shit's about to go down like it, yeah. i don't know it's like the most brilliant way to like build tension there to me yeah it was just a great way of just building suspense and the suspense and suspense where like you know this movie for the most part you know while this is obviously the big dinosaur movie the dinosaurs really only take up maybe like 11 percent of the whole movie in terms of like what you see but they make the moments pay off as much as possible oh yeah it's a big payoff and i think that first introduction of the dinosaurs when they're driving is so well done like you've seen that clip a hundred thousand times of yeah (laughs) of grant sam neill taking the glasses off with like the most stunned face and grabbing laura dern's head and twisting it and then the release of the brontosaurus like with that with that classic score underneath it with those strings it's like it's really it really is powerful how they how they pace and space them out because it makes that impact better and i feel like that's a detriment of the sequels if we want to tie those into there together is that like they're kind of everywhere and they lose their impact when you just see them for 50 percent of the movie yeah exactly they just go like a little bit too heavy on the special effects i mean 
I've seen the original trilogy and I've seen World, but I haven't seen the, se- the any of the sequels for World. Apparently, the most recent one that came out what last year apparently is a garbage from what I've heard. <laughs> is it that recent? Damn. Yeah. I've, well, I've not seen any of the sequels either for either trilogy, to be fair. You just said you saw World. <laughs> Yeah, no. Oh, well, I'm considering that the, the reboot. I saw World and I saw Park, but none of the yeah. next yeah, two yeah. in those trilogies, you know? I, I mean, I mean, like, you know, the best thing you could say about some of them is that, like, I remember World had a scene of, like, a woman just, like, getting, like, killed, like, to death, where, like, she got, like, eaten by one animal that ate another animal that ate another animal or something like that. Killed to um, death sounds like a damn band that you should sounds start like a right me- now. It sounds like a metal band killed yeah. to yeah, death. Yeah, some random metal band. <laughs> Metal covers of the Jurassic Park theme song, stuff like that. <laughs> that would hit. Oh, the, I, I, that I, would hit. I mean, but you hear, you hear that John Williams score, like when that scene you were just talking about, Timmy, like earlier, with like "Welcome to Jurassic Park," goosebumps immediately. Like yeah. anytime you hear that score, I mean, like you can. Uh, I feel like Ryan. I remember like us probably listened to like a slowed down version of it before, of like four hours long or something like that, where it's just like stretched out. Different. We listen to it. We listen to four hours long I, Jurassic Park I, theme song. Well, I don't think I don't think we listened to the whole thing, but I think we did something like that. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that sounds familiar. Actually, now that I think about it, <laughs> <laughs> no, but the score is so good. Like I don't know that. Like no, no, no. It's it's iconic, dude. Like yeah. John Williams hits another home run as always. Exactly. It's just like amazing. He can do no fucking wrong. Um, I want to talk about ways this movie could have gone wrong. Um, so we talked about Clay Mason earlier, but like. This movie essentially is based off the novel, which uh, Ryan read 10 years ago and just decided to never watch the movie. But, um, <laughs> you know, before this movie was, uh, before the novel was even like finished whatsoever, like Hollywood Studios, right? Okay, Michael Crane's coming up a new novel. We need to get a bidding war for this right now. We need rights to spot dinosaurs. This is going to be a guaranteed hit. So, Michael Crane's agents uh, pretty much circulated the book to six different studios. And they decided to pitch this movie. And the pitches were Warner Brothers won Tim Burton to direct. Columbia wanted Richard Donner to direct the director of Superman. Um, 20th Century Fox uh, was interested and they wanted Joe Dante. And then Universal Pictures of Steven Spielberg and apparently James Cameron was in the mix too. And thank God Steven Spielberg got it. A lot of these other takes would have been interesting. I mean, like the Tim Burton version probably would have been Jeff Goldblum would have been more of a goth. And I don't know. What uh, we read there. I don't know about the Tim, I don't know about the Tim Burton version of it. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That would have been like eh, Richard Donner. I don't know, maybe a little bit too hokey. Joe Dante could have been a fun manic version of this. The James Cameron version, apparently, he wanted to pitch was going to be R rated and going to have Arnold Schwarzenegger as Grant and um, ah, that could have been cool. To be fair, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would have just been version. Arnold running around with a gun shooting dinosaurs. That's what. That's yeah. what that movie would have been. <laughs> Dude, I could yeah, see Arnold I, as Muldoon or something too. Like that would be lit. <laughs> I, I would totally, I totally watch that movie. Like Bill Pax as Malcolm, Charlton Heston as Hammond. That would have worked, but I think we got the right director. I mean, like James Cameron himself even said, like you know, if I got the movie, it wouldn't have made sense. Di- kids love dinosaurs. Would have been a treasure to kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the Joe That's Dante like... one's the interesting one to me there because I think of him with Gremlins, Small Soldiers. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't have been the commercial hit that it was, and it might have spared us a lot of really bad sequels. But it mm-hmm. would have, uh, it would have been interesting for sure. And I feel like he would have had his own. He's he's a very cynical director. I've noticed in the tone of his movies, and I feel like that would have that would have been very interesting to come out. It would have had a much more cynical tone to it, which I could definitely see from like these scientists visiting this island, and to transition that into. John Hammond, um, where this is the time that I really like appreciated his perform, like his per- his performance in this movie, um, uh, and yeah, Richard Richard Attenborough as Doc as John Hammond. Um, this is he- like his first acting role in fourteen years. I mean, he's you know, normally a director. I mean, he did Chaplin and like what um. Gandhi and stuff like that. And like he just said, like, all right, I'll come out for Spielberg. <laughs> Exclusively for, for Spielberg. I'll come back yeah. for this. Um, he's the main antagonist of this movie, I, I feel like. Uh, it's either him or Nedry, which is played by everybody's favorite neighbor, Newman, Wayne Newman. He, oh, he's he's amazing. I mean, like every, every time it's that movie, but Richard Arbo in general, I mean, he brings a little bit of a heart. I mean, he is an antagonist, but 
apparently in the novel he was more of a jerk like a fucking like jackass i don't know if you remember ryan yeah no i i remember him being definitely more of an asshole and stuff and like even like in the writing they like oh he he's like he he's like oh people who watch sports are like the lowest dregs of society and i was just like damn like they want us to hate him so bad like but uh honestly it's like some pretentious sports ball Oh yeah, I remember though. Like, yeah, he was definitely an asshole in the books, and in the movie, I truly believe that this is a guy who just has has this dream and he wants to make it happen. But like, by the end of it, like when they're like, "We decide to oppose you building this park," and he's like, "Yeah, obviously, so have I." You know, like <laughs> he realizes yeah. by the end this is not a good idea, and I truly believe that it's it's not him and he he never is the one trying to make money like the lawyer guy is like oh we need to open we need to oh, make the so, money you know oh, so, but yeah. uh what do you think you oh, you, was, you disagree to him he was in it for the money it was a dream but he was in it for the money no but when the lawyer brings up he's like he's like yes like people will pay whatever and then hammond is like well this isn't just for rich people we want everyone to be able to experience this like amazing park and stuff i I'm don't gonna, know like i'm gonna frame this for you differently Richard Attenborough as Hammond yeah. is a politician in October with an election in November. And now he has these three scientists here. And the lawyer, Guy Gennaro, is saying, like, we are, we can charge whatever we want for this, blah, blah, blah. Well, he has to appease to these three scientists that are here that aren't really capitalists. So they don't want to talk about it. Mm. But you get the shot when his kids are lost in the park with, with Grant and they're in they cut to him eating the ice cream in the visitor center doesn't just cut to him it cuts to the gift shop with all the little trinkets of the jurassic park logo slapped on it on a lunchbox on a t-shirt with stuffed action figures and everything else man was a capitalist at heart okay you don't you, don't, you may, maybe disagree with that like i got it from that and especially on this take this this viewing i i really noticed it um you know, when they first go on the tour and the gates open, it's a, it, that's a boring part of the movie. And it's very intentionally boring because Hammond is, that's when he gets at his angriest. It's not when his grandkids get attacked by a Tyrannosaurus Rex. He gets his angriest when they're going on the tour and they there are no dinosaurs out for them to see. That's when he's at his most upset. Because he wants to put on the show. It's a show. He's he's a he's an illusionist. He's a wizard. And they have that great scene with him and Ellie where he talks about the illusion that that he yeah. had that you know, the old show that he did. Um that that's what it is. And and he's somebody that doesn't really does not understand the power of what he has created here. Um and making it into a theme park is like the epitome of that. Like if you wanted to just make a nature preserve and it you just it was if, if he was not a capitalist at heart looking to make money it would have just been a nature preserve and this would have been his passion project and that's, people would have yeah. just funded it for the scientific research I mean, I, of it i don't think all, it was all altruistic for him but like i yeah. think that uh, definitely a portion of him i mean like there's a, almost like a childlike wonder he has about this well that and that's attenborough's performance i think is where that comes in like where you said in the book he comes off a lot more asshole-ish i think you could have casted a lot more actors and and hammond comes off really snide really well they they intentionally uh like uh defanged him a little bit um so um like in terms of like the screenplay and stuff oh yeah absolutely Um, absolutely. he's even like like when every all the power goes off and stuff he's like no like i should go like you should stay here and stuff and like she's like no i'm going just like you think i can't because i'm a woman or whatever like i don't know i think i think he's got some heart regardless of I'm not saying he does. I'm not saying he doesn't. I'm just, I completely disagree with you saying that he wasn't in it for the money. He was absolutely in in it for the money. He was a politician in October lying to a crowd of people. All right. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, okay. I'm not saying you're wrong on that. I think it was, I I I, felt that I liked him by the end. I I liked him in the end. I I love him. I think he's a great character. Um, Yeah. I I think he really brings an interesting dynamic. And I think, Compared to the other Jurassic Park movies, which I've seen five of the six of them, and most of them I've only seen once, um, yeah. like the story yeah. is lacking in them, and the 
the the themes behind them because i would say this movie has a, a lot of themes about the power of nature and the power of creation that the other movies just com- are like we're going to make a dumb dinosaur movie and it, that's not really the ca- case with the original jurassic park um and hammond is kind of the key in that because he is the godlike figure in terms of creating creating that atmosphere um like, I mean, he's even breeding velociraptors, which are the most dangerous to have. Like when when they hatch the little velociraptor and you just see Grant's face turn when he's like, oh, we have we have raptors like you have raptors on here and you want me and you want people to to see them, to to view them. Yeah, like <laughs> he, he was he was somebody that was a man of own convictions but he's ultimately the person who shot himself in the foot in terms of even getting the park opening because yeah one of the themes of it is what life finds a way and um they talked about how the the creatures you know they made them all female so they wouldn't be able to reproduce and then they find the dinosaur eggs i think there's a couple of ways you could interpret that I interpreted it as you don't see that until the Barbasol can with the with the dinosaur enzymes gets lost in the woods, which is by which was by Nedry, who was trying to sell them off because he had financial issues that Hammond would not help him with. A, a man with more money than God. I, I mean, I mean in, in your defense, there is some subtext of this. I think this comes up more in the novel of like Dennis Nedry just being like getting apparently fucked over by um, Hammond over and over and over again. Or like uh, him and cause him like lose clients and stuff like that apparently, and um, it's just you know how he says that like you know we spared no expense right here, but then like turns out maybe he's treating employees like shit and not paying them what they're worth or something, you know. <laughs> Dude, moral of the story: pay your IT guy. And it reminded me of like the yeah. Matrix and shit, you know, like we got we got a rat in the ship, you know, like same the same type of story. Like make sure your people are taken care of, or they're gonna they're gonna fuck you over too, you know. I yeah. thought that he'd be like a bigger part in the movie, though. Honestly, like he was probably, I don't Newman know, or, it, uh, Newman, Newman, dude. Yeah, yeah Wayne, Wayne Knight. Knight, dude. Wayne he, Knight. He, he wasn't he in has, it for that long. I mean, he has like the most. It's one of the most memorable lines of this. I'm just like, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that was and, great. And honestly. the whole meme, the meme that you see all the time now, just like you see, nobody fucking cares. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 But it, Dogson, Dogson, see. Nobody cares. You're not gonna get cheap on me now, Dogson, are you? And, and, and his death seems amazing. Where he's like, oh, you know, no wonder you're extinct, and immediately gets fucking like this goo in his eyes, the, the poison right in his face. Yeah, and, and he's he's a total steal scene stealer, but he's he's ultimately the person responsible for the, everything going completely wrong because he was there to decode oh, the yeah. line. Nothing nothing goes wrong, but. He had clear yeah. motivation to be away from his desk. It wasn't some cheap like, I'm going to go get a soda. And then he got locked out of the door and he's just like so, sitting on oh, the other the side. Oh, the fat guy got, uh, lost getting soda. What a shocker. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, he uh, won that role because uh, Steven Spielberg loved him in uh, Basic Instinct. We covered that movie last year. Wayne Knight, what a 90s run right there. Basic Instinct, probably best seen in that movie too. <laughs> well, that I've has never the, seen it. That has the infamous leg crossing scene, which if you've never seen it, but you've probably heard of Sharon Stone crossing her legs or at least seen oh, some shit. variation of that. Yeah, Wayne knew that like she crosses her legs. And if I'm remembering it correctly, it literally cuts to Wayne Newman's face, like sweating <laughs> like a dog. But, yeah, Wayne, Wayne Knight. <laughs> so it, it cuts to like Sharon Stone's vagina to Wayne Knight's face sweating as fuck it's like oh shit you had to pause it so fucking clearly if you're a fucking teenage boy in the 90s <laughs> all right tommy we know what you did last week just you know please, <laughs> leave, please leave it alone if by teenage boy you mean tommy and the 90s you mean last week then yes <laughs> it was in the 90s last week in the temperature so i mean oh yeah <laughs> so it was nice and warm. Um, Tommy's <laughs> getting sweaty like Newman in his seat there. Oh my, yeah, <laughs> we don't <laughs> start dripping. We don't do the visuals here, but he is sweating right now. He's giving me that glare of like Tim. This might end the podcast right here. We might never do another episode again. Uh, but he, I, 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 I'm glad we harped on Hammond's character here because I I'm on a completely different boat from from both of you here. I I think yeah. he's positioned that way really well, and I think they took a lot of the bark that's 
clearly in the novel away from him to make him more likable and warm. So that way you don't feel that way about him. But I felt like all of his underlying motions signaled that he was the exact same character that he probably was in the book. He just comes off a lot warmer. He comes off a lot more like Papa Bear. Uh, that could be. I I'm willing to to contest you might be right on that. But I think, you know, something that Tommy said, childlike wonder is still something that I think he possesses about these dinosaurs. Whether he is willing to kind of fuck people over for the like for attaining this childlike wonder and sharing it with people over people around the world, like that's possible. I'm willing to admit that's possible. But I still found him likable because uh because of that still. I don't know by the end he's very likable i'm not even yeah. disagreeing with that i'm just saying the underlying motions there of him being like a true capitalist that's yeah maybe a little bit cutthroat is, is like there like he it's, gets it's, i mean to an extent it's the charming facade of like every uh billionaire you know like they have behind them or of you like, might you know, be right yeah i mean i mean the more the more we're talking about it i don't know but yeah. um I, I I do think that there is some at least a little bit of innocence to him. I don't obviously money is probably the driving factor, but it's not all the money for him. I don't I don't think so. <laughs> no, and I don't think the project gets its wheels off the ground if there wasn't that childlike wonder of the of the dinosaurs. I feel like that wasn't necessarily like covered in there because like the one moment we get any background into his character it's to do with his other business project that was a success, but kind of labeled him as like a hokey salesman. And I was like, that's what he is. He's a hokey salesman. He's a somebody at the turn of the century going by cart to cart, selling elixirs. Like that's what, that's I, what he is. I, I, I mean, like, you know, we're going to like get the ire of all the Elon fans, but this is, you know, you can see the parallels between Elon saying we're going to Mars. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I was thinking the exact same thing when you're talking about that. And I do <laughs> consider myself still a bit of an Elon fan. I think he's lost his way in the last couple of years, but overall, I'm still a fan of his. Yo, he's gonna beat up Zuckerberg in the in the Coliseum no, for not. damn he, sure. No, no they not. called it off. I'm, <laughs> oh, I'm joking. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah, yeah. <laughs> they called he, it he off. He totally whipped but... out on it. <laughs> I, listen, um, he, Zuckerberg is like like he's on some sort of spectrum, whatever you want to define it as. And somebody so is like Elon that, though. Uh, different side, but the different obsessions. Like Zuckerberg's been like practicing jujitsu for years. And oh, Elon really? Musk has like 50 pounds of fat on him. That's like yeah. the, <laughs> the only way he could win is if he sits on him. Fair that's enough. That's how I want. That's that. a bold strategy, Cotton. Yo, that's Let's another one. I, I just off. watched that like a week ago or less. Oh, <laughs> what a what a fan! What a fantastic film! What a what oh a yeah, film. absolutely fantastic film. <laughs> I am a star. I'm a star. I'm a star. I'm a star. I am a big, bright, shining star. So this is the Richard Attenborough memorial list of everybody else in the movie that we can discuss, considering we just discussed Hammond for a good 15 minutes. Um, it, 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 I feel like it almost goes without saying Jeff Goldblum, but I, I'm curious what your guys' thoughts of, of I, Ian Malcolm. I, I, I mean, Ian Malcolm, uh, you know, him with his shirt open, Jeff Goldblum, yeah, I'm right there. Um, but anyways, uh, fucking... Sam Neill, great in this movie. I mean, like, you know, he gives, I think, one of the best character arcs of this whole movie. I mean, he'd probably be the protagonist of anyone is. I mean, the fact that he gets over... He definitely he, is. Yeah, he gets over, like, the hatred of the kids and stuff like that. And his performance is just really great. And just, like, the monologues he has, like, the opening scene of him intimidating that kid that thinks that dinosaurs aren't oh, all shit. such a good scene. It's such a good character yeah. introduction scene. Like, we learn mm -hmm. something that's going to come into play later. And we're also learning something about the character. It's funny when you watch a movie, when you see those things happen. Um, yeah. I was like literally about to bring up that, that scene there. Yeah, he kind of has the the prototypical hero's arc, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. in this kind of story. Uh, and he was Lord, perfectly cast. There was um, chances that Harrison Ford was going to be in this role. I could see Harrison Robin. Ford. I was just going to say, dude, I feel like the only one who could have played it better was Harrison Ford, man. I, mean, I didn't I know mean, he was even in talks, but that would be sick. <laughs> it would it would have been, it would have been good, but like you know, at the time, this would have become a Harrison Ford movie rather than like a movie about dinosaurs. Sam Neill, while like you know, he's not a household name the way that Harrison Ford is, or even like Tim Robbins at the time, probably. 
I don't even. I wouldn't even maybe consider Tim Robbins like. Yeah. Oh, I, you're right. Harrison Ford definitely. Harrison Ford's <laughs> like your true A-lister, and that turns into a Harrison Ford movie when he's when he's in it. Same same thing we were talking about Schwarzenegger earlier. That would have just been a Schwarzenegger. Movie. It would have been a Schwarzenegger movie. It's the same thing with like how we were talking about with Sorcerer with um, oh, what's his name, the guy from Jaws. Oh, um, what Richard Dreyfus or R- Richard Dreyfus? Yeah, where we were. No, not Richard Dreyfus. Who's the Guy plays, uh, yeah, Richard Dreyfus, right? He was in Sorcerer, yeah. Where Friedkin said basically, like, he's a great actor, but he doesn't have the juice to carry a movie on his own in in the mass public. Like, he's just not that kind of guy. Um, yeah. And Sam Neill's kind of in that same vein where you're you're always going to get a top tier performance from him, but he just doesn't have that that A list like juice to him. Of just, and I think that. it worked better for the movie because oh, definitely, the, oh, it definitely mar- does. Yeah, because the marketing of this movie, I mean, like, which was an insane by the time uh, period uh, standards of like marketing, where they had so many fucking tie-ins, and the marketing apparently cost more than the actual movie, which is insane. But um, it was well, all about the dinosaurs. Well, it's funny. <laughs> like a, a year later, the biggest movie star in this movie is Samuel L. Jackson, like who's like yeah. the eighth build character in the movie. <laughs> Very brief. <laughs> Ryan, who would you say was your favorite performance sans Richard Hammond? I would, you know, I would say it's got to be Jeff. Honestly, like there were some some scene stealing moments by other uh, other actors for sure, and Sam Neill obviously was the probably only one with like a proper like character arc, you know. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, Jeff Goldblum, like even like in one of the first scenes, they're like. They said something to the effect of like, we wanted a scientist. You brought us a rock star. And he literally like lives up yeah. to that. Like every scene, it's just, I don't know. Like he's so magnetic and I want to hang out with that black. dude, man. Yeah. yeah, dude, he's sick. And he like yeah. sacrifices himself, like, near, but still manages to be in the rest of the movie. I don't know. Like it, it's uh, got to be Jeff for me, you know? I mean, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard in the novel that he would dies in the novel. Spoilers for the novel. I don't even remember, to be honest. Um, but yeah. like, but I mean, if that was the case, I mean, like, thank God they didn't. It's like, what a character. I mean, like, well, oh, yeah. after the sequels sucked, you can see why the sequels took on Jeff Goldblum as like the main character for this, uh, the direct sequel. Yeah. <laughs> Tommy, did you say your your star? I, I as much as I talk about Sam Neill here, I, I think Jeff Goldblum. I mean, he has the most memorable lines um, of anyone. You know, well, I'm like, gonna say Sam Neill because I've always been a Sam Neill guy. I've never been the biggest Jeff Goldblum guy in this movie. Like, it works for the character. I just like Sam Neill's character more. I just like that archaeologist vibe. Like, I'm I was thinking, I was like, maybe I'll be him for Halloween this year. That could be a move for sure. Could be a move. Ah, are you ready, comedy partner? Waka waka. I think the real reason behind that is I do want to get a cowboy hat, but I have no justification or reason to purchase one. <laughs> so I feel like being Sam Neill in Jurassic Park for Halloween is like the only real reason I could ever consider actually making that purchase. So that's that's pretty much the driving factor behind it. Yeah, that's, know, how, man. that's how every guy gets their first fedora because they want to be Indiana Jones. <laughs> Dude, but you've slip. been living you've been living in Nashville for what nearly a year now right like eight ten eight, months eight, eight, eight months, months something like that. you're going full national dude i mean <laughs> yo like i'm surprised you don't have a cowboy hat yet i think that's the last <laughs> step to making you a naturalized citizen or something <laughs> yeah, exactly it's my citizenship test yeah exactly exactly do you have a cowboy hat <laughs> do i have a cowboy hat uh no uh but in terms of cowboy hats imagine a bunch of muppets wearing cowboy hats running around jurassic park what do we think I, do, do we think, it's I, I, think I think you, i think you keep the human cast the same and you just make the dinosaurs muppets and it's not even just like the scary muppets it's just like animal is like the t-rex or something like that <laughs> and Fozzie's like the velociraptor or something well, that would be big bird would be the t-rex Dude, now that oh, now yeah. that I I just thought of this right yeah. now, like I'm finally on this show, and I get to say I'm offended personally that on a previous episode, you said that Sweetums wasn't one of the most magnetic Muppets. Sweetums, the giant guy with the hair and the huge nose, like he's awesome. He's such a good like. Uh, I think he's actually a good guy, but they think he's a villain in some of them because he's just very intimidating. Um, Sweetums oh, yeah. rocks. I mean, he- Sweet Sweetums does rock. He, he's great. I mean, I'm really watching right now. I pulled up as we were talking. 
um they made a sesame street jurassic park uh fucking like parody and it's like cookie monster cookie monster is like the thing (laughs) oh my god dude that's awesome that's great i mean I think we're yeah. all in agreement. This definitely works as a Muppet adaptation really well. Yeah. I, like, I mean, you just make the cheesy special effects just straight up Muppets. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think I, Muldoon, Muldoon would be a good Muppet too, you know? Oh, uh, Muldoon also just low key underrated. Like he's got like five minutes of screen time and he kills it the yeah, entire uh-huh. time he's on there. And his last Clever line, girl. Like, Clever. dude. Clever, so good. Yeah. <laughs> what, what a great death line. <laughs> uh, ultimate death line. All right. So, Ryan, you know the drill here. Give us your review out of five on Jurassic Park. Okay. Uh, Knee-jerk reaction, I'm going to say it's a 3.5. I did really like watching it. It wasn't something that I'm probably going to go rewatch as many times as you guys have. Um, But, yeah, no, I liked it a lot. um, And also a lot more than I thought I would. So I would say it's banging. But, uh, yeah, uh, I guess didn't. Well, it wasn't anything that I'm going to I'm going to probably talk about or think about uh, all that hard compared to some of my faves. Ouch. Ouch. Wow. Might yeah. as well giving it a one out of five. Jesus. All right, yeah. Tommy, your score. Uh, five out of five. This movie's been sticking with me since like childhood. Um, Fair. Every time I see it in the theaters, it hits just as well. And like it's something that, like I can see this movie endless amount of times and be totally fine with it. I mean, you know, it's a total cable movie too. I mean, like I remember last year I watched just like the first half of this and I was like, cool. I mean, I got, I got my fix right here. So great performances, great special effects and great like mix of comedy and like horror and like, you know, adventure and stuff like that. Spielberg just knocked out of the park here. Five out of five. <laughs> I'm, I'm also going to go five out of five because I, I just think there's a layer to this movie beyond being like a horror sci-fi dinosaur movie thinking of which and i think the movie primarily focuses on the creation of these of somebody actually doing this and like do you have like do you understand what you've done aspect to it which is basically what unfolds from there uh from that conversation but it's an instant classic there's a reason there's five sequels that share its name none of them anywhere near as good but people still go in droves because they love this movie they connect to it an unreal score, terrific performances, uh, groundbreaking special effects. Um, one of the all-time movies of all time, without a question. Man, I can't believe I gave a lower score than Tim. I feel like Tim's the big critic on this uh, on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Usually, shit. I'm, I'm usually I'm usually the softy. <laughs> I know Tommy is the softy out of us, but like you, you knew going in what I was probably going to give Jurassic Park. So. Uh, that's a, that's a, we'll, we'll have to have you back on another week. We appreciate you coming on, Ryan. It's been a lot of fun. Hell yeah, dudes. I really appreciate you guys having me on and just let me know when we could do this again, man. Of course. <laughs> do you have anything you want to plug? Anything last minute? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll do a little plug. All right. Curse of Tongues, my DJ name. We got a single coming out September 22nd on uh, Noise Porn Records. It's going to be wild. No porn, but just beautiful noise you know um nice. <laughs> yeah <laughs> fuck yeah <laughs> and tommy any final thoughts before we wrap this up uh the screen i went to was awful um where there's some like fucking like five kids that kept on coming in and out of the theater and like maybe we we're in the theater all right for, like, alan minutes. all right alan grant please 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 yeah keep, keep, but anyways kids time. suck kids suck fuck fuck it uh but anyways <laughs> thank you so much for listening um you know, you can follow us on social media at CNETPod. That's on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and also threads. I'm still going to bring that up to me. I know it's dead, but still going to bring it up. Bring up those threads. We'll see what Elon and uh, Musk, uh, Elon and fucking Zuckerberg go to. But anyways, uh, also leave it a five-star review. Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast, really helps out the show. And thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you all so much for listening. We'll figure out our September schedule and see you next time.